just put it in some tag grant applications. Yeah, this next month we were just getting all our ones completed from this last year. And it was uh -huh. such a short period. Yeah, I know. Was, uh, I put mine in on yeah. Friday. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to put some in April. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. But our last one was yesterday. That one does really need to Then we'll just start. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, we're gonna uh, turn the lights off. That way, you guys get a better visual. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm Linda Walensky. I'm a conservation photographer. Um, it, right now, it is still a hobby, but it is my passion, and um, it's just an introduction of how to reach um, people through your photography. Uh, to hopefully be better stewards of our environment. So let's dive right in. So Florida has an immense amount of breathtaking landscape. And here are just some of the views that are all happening in, in one state. And I find it quite incredible of what of kind of uh, diversity that we have here. So we have bogs and um, swamps. We have ranches and rivers lakes, and seas. And one of the most special things to me uh, in regards to the sea is uh, we have, it's a home to a lot of different species of sea turtles. It is the loggerhead's biggest nesting site in the whole world. So um, at this particular beach, we have um, the loggerheads and the green, between the loggerheads and the green sea turtles, we have about 20,000 nests a year, so it's a significant conservation story, uh, thanks to Archie Carr that established that uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And here's a little glimpse into the sea turtle world. We get to the springs, but um, all waters are somewhat connected, so I did put a little bit of sea turtles in there as well. We share our Florida with some of the most amazing critters, and of course, that includes the American alligators. And um, when I, when I take pictures of alligators, I always get the question, well, aren't you scared, you know? Or um, if I find myself in the ocean with sharks, um, I always say that my biggest fear isn't the wildlife, it's losing it. And um, of course, we're always afraid of alligators. We think as soon as we dip our feet in the water, they're just waiting for us to, you know, to ambush us. But um, if you look at the statistics, it's very, um, clear that alligators are really not the problem or shouldn't be feared as much as traffic. And that is really uh, my response that I always have. I always say, you know, I'm not afraid of the alligators. I'm afraid of traffic. Um, in 73 years, there was only 26 fatal attacks, very unfortunate 26 fatal attacks. But if you put that in relation to uh, car accidents in just one year, that is almost 3,500 car accidents a year. So it's, it really puts the danger of the wildlife in perspective. And just a little side story. So this alligator had a, a, a twig over its snout, right? And I, I learned um, a little bit later on, this is actually a behavior that they have in the springtime. Um, the wading birds look for uh, the perfect stick to build their nests and the alligator uh, gets their snack. So um, it, it's, it's genius, it's, it's cruel, but it's genius. And here's a little clip of the alligator world. So the poster child of our beloved springs are the chubby mermaids, AKA manatees. And we just go right into another clip. So our Florida is alive and breathing but um, as we already heard from the specialists, our springs are not doing well, and it needs all of us to get together and decide to do the right thing for the springs, whether it's nitrates, dissolved oxygen. I think um, one of the best ways to help the springs is be mindful of our own um, actions that we do, and um, also support organizations um, that fight for our springs. So this is how I found my voice in um, not just photography, but conservation photography. Uh, we recently moved to the Rainbow River, very popular and um, famous river. 
And um, what I've noticed more than when I just visited every now and then are the changes and some things that just stay the same. Like I would, I would know if I go around the corner, the cormorant would be there or that would be a, a tree and around that tree would be the bass, right? So I, I saw that, but I also unfortunately saw changes um, you know, the degradation of the riverbanks because people were hanging the hammocks and the, the broken limbs. So it was bittersweet to, 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 to see the changes and also the good and the bad. So um, that's when I decided that I needed to express that through my pictures and um, get people more aware of um, what's going on. Here's just a picture of the cormorant. And you know, you find little things when you kind of take your time and you don't have to rush because, you know, the boat ramp is going to be packed or, you know, the, the kayak rental is, is, is going to be uh, running out of kayak. So um, I now have the luxury to just, you know, get on the water at, at, at 5.30 in the morning on this, in the summer and beat the crowds and still enjoy the wildlife that's there before they go into hiding. And I go in hiding as well. <laughs> Let's be honest here. And every day there's something different. I mean, there's nothing is, is ever the same. It's, it's ever changing. But it's, there's so much uh, beauty still found. So what is conservation photography? A lot of people, and including myself, when I hear conservation photography is, I have to be in National Geographic. I have to be this published photographer. And um, you know my skill has to be excellent, and my knowledge has to be even better. Um, that is not the case. What we more need of than anything else is people taking pictures, and most importantly, talking about what they're captured and how it moved them, and what they really simply observed. This is how we would get out into the public and kind of get them more to care. It's a very, uh, a very powerful tool to match your photography with the story because people, you know, of course, we're visual creatures, so we look at pictures first. So if we can combine that with a story, it's a win-win. So what is conservation photography? Wildlife always takes priority. I can't say that enough. Um, I have learned over the years not every nature photography really loves nature. They just love their great picture, right? That is not the, the purpose of uh, conservation photography. Conservation photography is to respect the wildlife. And sometimes it also means not taking a picture because that wildlife already had a rough day. It's already stressed out from all the people that were on the river. So if you see kind of um, this behavior of an animal kind of being restless, it is so much more important to just not take a picture. And that is conservation, believe it or not. And um, I can say from experience, um, the time where I didn't take the pictures and missed the shot were rewarded with some of the most intimate moments that I've captured on camera later on sometime. So I, I strongly recommend um, always putting the wildlife first. It's um, sometimes um, you will also have to get used to people not really liking you. Um, I, I do have a picture that I still don't give the location um, because I, I still feel like I would be part of the problem by giving the location. I have lost sales over that uh, picture because people are like, well, I'm buying it. You're not going to tell me where it is. No, unfortunately, because for me, wildlife always goes first. If I lose a sale, that's OK. But at least I didn't lose my integrity of you know, broadcasting this location where the manatee maybe still is by itself or in, in peace more than you know, 20 photographers or other people swarming around it. So it is something that is to your discretion. I'm not telling you not to ever give locations. It's just something I do in certain locations, not all of them. Um, but where I feel like the wildlife would be severely impacted by giving the location, I just don't. Um, you know, conservation photography is showing the good and the bad. I can't just stay here and say, oh, you know, look at the beautiful springs and they're doing well and, you know, everything's fine. Um, we do have to also take the bad pictures and the sad pictures because they are 
part of what we're seeing, and that is really also something that can, you know, motivate someone to, to get more active in, in conservation. It takes determination, passion, and patience, and it also takes hope because when you are constantly hearing, you know, the springs are imperiled, this is going bad, and this is going bad, it kind of really can put a damper on your outlook on uh, the nature and specifically, but I think working with organizations that are fighting every single day for uh, the Springs Health um, it really gives you hope and it, it makes you feel part of, you know, at least you're trying. You're trying to be there, you're trying to raise awareness and that will kind of overshadow the bad. It, it kind of fuels your own fire to, to conservation. Um, for wildlife uh, photography in general, it's always good to know the animal's behavior. So if I want to photograph manatees, I'm not going to go in 95 degrees, right? Because the manatees are not going to be in the springs because they're only in the springs in the winter time um, because they can tolerate any temperature below 65. It can get uh, fatal for them. So um, always keep in mind what the animal um, likes to eat or what time it goes out, uh, things like that. And it's always, you know, respect it and respect their space. So these are kind of like examples of the good and bad. This is Gilchrist Blue Springs on a very, very happy, healthy day. Um, there's a turtle just indulging in the submerged aquatic vegetation. But then summer came around and um, so that picture really is a good example of telling a story because you can see the white spots, that's footsteps, right? And um, I made sure to highlight that kayak only sign. So really this tells the story of people still using it and trampling the, the spring run to death, even though it's already there asking them to use the kayak. So all this vegetation kind of, you know, got trampled over the summer um, by hundreds and hundreds of people. And um, it's, it's just sad how something so healthy goes to completely gone within just a few months. This spring run is the one that was impacted by Irma. Um, the, the panelists kind of talked about it and um, it was pretty much dead because it was flooded for too long. Um, the vegetation didn't get enough sunlight, and um, once it cleared up, it slowly uh, came growing back, and that was the previous picture where the vegetation was, was really flourishing again, and unfortunately, it only takes one summer of high traffic, and it can be wiped out again. But it does show that vegetation can recover if we leave it alone. So this is Alexander Springs on a very, very good day. I have not seen it this way ever again. Um, I don't visit it often, so I, I can't say that it never came back. But this is Alexander Springs on a regular day. See, this is, this is what you want to do with conservation photography. You want to make people aware that it's not always good. It's sometimes bad, but there's also, there also has to be a balance. You don't want to just be a downer and say, well, we're doomed. Don't worry about the springs anymore. They're going to be gone. We want to instill hope at all times. This is Manatee Springs, and this is Manatee Springs underwater. So I always say, even if you're not an outside person, you hate being in nature and you're scared of nature, um, it brings a lot of revenue to the state of Florida, billions. So if you're, even if you're money-oriented, you want to have the springs in good shape because that is what, what is bringing in money to the state. This is Silver Glen in the summer. So the hybrid striped bass are pretty much the opposite of manatees. Um, those bass swimming t swim into the spring. When it gets too hot in the summer, they can't tolerate the warm water of the St. John's. So, you know, what the manatees do in the winter to come in the spring, they kind of do in the summer. So this is Silver Glen, and this is also Silver Glen the same day. The same day, just a few feet away, and um, not many really pay attention to it, but it's just, again, it's the good and the bad. 
And this is probably the saddest encounter I've ever had uh, with wildlife. Last winter, I found this manatee at uh, North Florida Spring, and it, it, it brought me to tears because it, it, it just, it made me feel helpless, right? This, this manatee just on the bottom of an algae-covered ground, and um, it's just looking up at me like, what are we doing? So um, that picture had a lot of uh, reactions on social media. A lot of people felt um, that empathy for it. So that is uh, one, another good example of uh, conservation photography, how pictures can really um, move people. And then, of course, the upside is also um, just as I felt sad about that one manatee, I felt so happy that these three manatees were just happy and healthy and they were eating the eelgrass, they were rolling around in it, nose diving, I mean anything you can, you can think of um, happened in that spring. So that was a very, very good day because um, I could see how it really is supposed to be. Look at them, munching away. So what does love mean? I think that um, we need to re redefine how we love nature, because we all do, right? We all seek the ethereal moments um, in the outdoors. But um, for a lot of them, it means recreation rather than conservation. So we have you know, boating, tubing, snorkeling, kayaking, swimming. But unfortunately, as previously mentioned, we're loving the springs to death. We're not thinking about how the springs would like for us to love them. So if you were a turtle and you had to come up for air, would you really want to breathe all that in? <laughs> Not good, right? Um, here is a, an example of how boats can damage the river bottom. I've been watching this for a very long time. It's not easily growing back. It's not like cotton lawn. It just keeps growing and the weeds keep growing. It's, it's still there for, for years. So it takes a very long time for something like that to recover. Anchors also rip out the eelgrass. It's also damaging. Eelgrass is a food and shelter for aquatic life. So um, if anyone needs to anchor, um, it should never be in the, in the eelgrass for that reason. So how do we get people to care, right? We've, we've heard the scientists. We have all these challenges. But I always say the biggest challenge is for to get people to care. How do we get people to say, hey, use less water, use less fertilizer, plant natives, you know, look at the nitrate load, check your septic. So we have all these things that we know for a fact are hurting our springs. But if you don't care, are you really going to change just because some scientist tells you, oh, it's the nitrates? We need people to care. We need to wake up their hearts so they feel compelled to do a difference, to make a difference, and to keep them alive. So what I found was to just find something that people love. It might be bats. It might be an otter. It might be a manatee. Something that they can relate to and they want to protect. And they know if they want that animal to survive, they need to protect their home. Because without the home, the wildlife is not going to be there either. So this is why I also use my uh, wildlife photography um, to kind of awaken a sense of, oh my god, this is so cute. How can I keep it alive? And this is a little clip of my favorite animal, the otters. So the otters are not just um, cute to me, but they also resemble a very significant conservation story. Um, there was about 500,000 river otters killed um, for, the, for their fur. And um, after that, they made a recovery. But then, you know, we took the wetlands away and then we polluted the waterways. So those poor things really couldn't really win. Um, unfortunately, now we are loving them so much. Um, the exotic animal trade has had a significant uptick, so everybody wants to have pet otters now, which is not good. Um, 
the mother usually gets killed, um, so they can capture the little ones, and then they dress them up, and they look so cute, right? And everybody wants a pet otter. Um, it's a very horrific um, thing that is now just the, the newest craze. If you look anywhere on YouTube and Google otters, you'll see tons and tons of little baby otters that really aren't supposed to be that little without their mother. So it is a big thing right now, and um, I felt compelled to kind of get the word out, and I just uh, created this really little thing, real TikTok thing, and um, it reached 11,000 people. So do not think that you can't do anything. It is very easy to spread awareness. So if you, you know, I'll just show you that little clip. I mean, it, it didn't take much to put this together, but 11,000 people were able to, to view this. Everybody could do that, right? It just takes a couple things on, on your phone and there it goes, out in the World Wide Web. So this is how pictures are supposed to be and this is how otters are supposed to be in their nature with their mom. And the mom caught a little turtle and um, it flipped it on its back at first so the turtle couldn't run away. And um, it taught its young to eat it. It wasn't really good for the turtle, but um, it, was a, it was painful to watch, I'm not gonna lie, because <laughs> I love turtles too. But um, it, it was okay because it's just a, a lesson of survival. So um, it's the good and the bad, but um, it also speaks of conservation photography in regards to that this mother was comfortable enough to continue with her lesson uh, for the baby and she was not um, impacted by me being there. So then I wanted to ID otters, right? Because I'm really getting into otters and I'm like, oh, I wonder, you know, how far up and down the river they go. So I, by reviewing one of the pictures, I saw that it had a tick on its ear. Well, this tick was removed shortly after that. So there goes my ID, right? But I also noticed that the same otter was missing a canine. So I'm like, oh, cool. You know, all I have to do now is wait for her to to come up and, and eat to, to see if, if it's the same otter. And for the longest time, I thought it was a male because it was always by itself. Well, it turned out to that she had a den and she was a mom. And the reason why she was by herself is because she was attending to the babies. And here's a couple images of that. They're so cute. So one of the babies had a, had a mustache. So I named him Milky. So there was two otters that I was able to identify. Um, I also came across these two guys. I didn't see them much, but um, you know, the mom just dropped them off at the dock and she was hunting and she just pretty much assigned me the, the babysitting role <laughs> for that day. <laughs> these are the same ones um, later on when they're more grown and they all shared an American eel together. And when I say conservation photography is not dangerous, it is. I almost died that day because it was so cute and my heart almost stopped because they were all in one space and it's just like, oh my God. <laughs> so I'm going to finish and, and um, ask you what your one thing is that you're worth, that you're trying to fight for and uh, worth protecting and um, research. Um, reach out to other people, join organizations. It's all worth it, the fight. And here's my contact information. Thank you. Any questions? What kind of equipment do you shoot with? I have a, a 400 millimeter lens, a zoom lens. 400 millimeters lens. It's a zoom lens to keep the wildlife safe. Can. Yes. Can yeah. So I have a Canon 80D in an underwater housing oh, okay. with a fish eye lens. Oh. That's how I get them underwater. iPhone. I get. I do all my videos with the iPhone. If I say anybody can do conservation photography, it really is. <laughs> Anyone can do conservation photography. Is there underwater housing for the iPhone? There is. 
I just, I don't bother. Right. I just put it in. Just stick it in the water. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes by the time I would haul the, the it, it's very heavy. The underwater housing is very heavy. So by the time I kind of tip myself almost over the kayak, whatever I wanted to, to catch a video of yeah. is going to be gone. So it's a lot easier. Yeah. My husband has really good insurance on it. <laughs> <laughs> So being a conservation photographer, how do you feel that your work, how are you reaching people with your work? Like a conservation photographer takes pictures of nature, right? How, how do you get the message out to the public? Like you're working very hard all the time to do what you do. To get to the general public, what is a good way to do that so that other body, everybody else sees those efforts and becomes noticeable and, and we start paying attention to what's happening. Joining nonprofits is one of the best ways because they're always looking for material. Um, you also can offer talks like I am doing. Um, social media is a very powerful tool because you're just reaching so many people at once. Um, you know, community, it, it doesn't take um, for you to, to travel anywhere. It really is um, community-based more than anything else. There's also conservation um, podcasts and things like that where they kind of give you links to, to other organizations. But um, there's always a niche somewhere where you can get out there. Did you do your own printing or do you? I send them off, yeah. Who does your printing for you? Anyone online, I don't have any specifics, oh, okay. yeah. Because I don't really focus on sales. It, it's more education. Um, eventually, I will want to get more into you know, selling my artwork. But right now, it's just basically focused more on education than anything else. Don't you sell your work in uh, Cedar Key? Yeah. But that was the first exhibit I've done in like two years. It's, um, like I said, I mean, I could do a lot more, but, um, you know, I don't have, to, with a full-time job, I don't have time either. <laughs> and I'd rather paddle on the river than, you know, go into uh, art festivals and things like that, so. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>